Hey everyone, welcome back to Thrive IT. As you know, my name is DJ Eshelman. If you didn't know that, well, now you do. Today we have something very special for you, and it is centered around one of our four key pillars. Uh, so to refresh your memory, those key pillars are mindset, methods, mastery, and mentoring. And today we're gonna focus on mindset and a little bit of mentoring thrown in just for fun. My friend Ken is gonna join us. Ken and I met at a, at a conference a couple years ago and it was great to connect with him again uh, in this conversation. It's had over Zoom and so it'll be a little bit different than our normal, but hopefully it'll get the gist of it and get something great out of it. There's actually a couple of examples that we give, uh, two that he gives to individuals that he worked with, uh, kind of names changed to protect the innocent kind of things. Uh, some great stories about how he was able to uh, uplift them and, and uncover things about them that I think is going to resonate with a lot of you. And so I highly encourage you to listen to the story. I think, especially for me, uh, the, the person we're calling Steve, uh, I've, I have felt a lot, a lot of connection with, with that, and so uh, I, I encourage you to, I don't want to give it away, but I encourage you to listen to that. I do encourage you to get subscribed because we've got lots of content like this that isn't on a normal schedule and doesn't happen on a regular basis, and so you might only hear about these things if you're subscribed, so we very much encourage you to do that. But at the end of the video, we're going to have some other special things going on, a little discount on a course that Ken has put together that is very much worth your time, and so that is going to be available with a special code that we'll be announcing at the end of the video, so make sure you stay on for that. But for now, enjoy this conversation with Ken Barron. Hi, welcome to Thrive IT. Today I have my friend Ken Barron. He's going to explain more about a lot of different things. We're going to talk about why soft skills may pay the bills, but there's more to it. And so I want to introduce to you Ken Brown from Elevaros. Hi, DJ. Thanks for having me on. This is, uh, this is really fun. I'm excited yeah. about it. As always. Now, Ken and I actually met, uh, oh gosh, I want to say four or five years ago, something like right. that, um, right here in my new hometown of Franklin, Tennessee. Now, uh, interestingly enough, we found right away that we had a couple of things in common. Even though we were attending a writer's conference, uh, both of us worked in the technology field and both of us hail from Colorado. So, uh, so I thought that was kind of a cool connection. So I thought I would have Ken on and share a little bit about our mutual background and more about Ken. So Ken, go ahead and introduce yourself a little bit and where you're from and let's get into kind of your background a little bit. Sure. Well, I'm Ken Broren. Uh, easy to pronounce, Broren. Just ignore that weird E in the middle. It uh, trips people up every time. But I run a company called Elevaros. I help technologists, you know, elevate, help them rise up. So just a quick cliff notes version of my background. I started my career in the Air Force, um, United States Air Force, left Denver, Colorado. Uh, I got to see the world. I got to see Biloxi, Mississippi for a year, and then Omaha, Nebraska for three more. So... <laughs> Uh, nice. You know, some people join the military and get to see the world. I got to see Mississippi and Nebraska. Uh, I quickly returned um, to Denver and to the IT world. Did computer and communications work in the Air Force. Uh, went to work for a large bank. Um, did a bunch of other internal IT work um, for a bunch of other large corporations as well. But one of the things that I, that really connected me to. <clears throat> DJ, the work you do and the Tribe Conference specifically was I really loved helping people grow. And I was curious, you know, how do writers write? How do you create something from nothing? How do you incorporate creativity in your day-to-day -day work? And I wanted to figure out how I could do that in yeah. the technology world. I really was going to technology conferences having very similar experiences every time. I'd learn a little new technology. I'd meet some people who were mostly the same crowd I always ran with. And I really didn't feel like I was growing. So I, uh, you know, attend a tribe and was really trying to discover like, how can I, how can I differentiate? And uh, that's when I ran into you. So yeah. um, it's really, it's really a lot of fun to uh, help people grow, help technologists really find out that, it's not just their technology skills that help them advance. Exactly. So I think another thing that's good to know is that sometimes our backgrounds 
aren't necessarily what end up being our expertise. Uh, so it's a very interesting dynamic there. So what did you start off with in technology and how did that evolve as you kind of went along in your career? Sure. Well, straight out of the Air Force, I was the Microsoft expert for a little company and um, they were full of Novell um, engineers, old school Novell engineers. This new Microsoft product was coming out and I was hired to train them on this new technology. And um, if you've ever been in that experience where you're with a bunch of older guys who know it all, and don't want to see anything new. And what you're showing them is inferior. That was what I got to cut my teeth on. <laughs> that's like almost every week on Thrivecast, but that's it's you know, pretty, yeah. pretty, pretty much the same. And and um, then I quickly went into managing storage area networks. You know, installing them for customers um, through a, a what was called then a VAR. Um, you know, reselling equipment, installing. Very quickly moved into the the corporate IT world, um, very fast growing. And it's weird to work for, to say I worked for a large US bank, but the growth was phenomenal. When I joined them in 2000, I think we did a funding of like a billion dollars in loans that year. When I left there in 2005, we did 12 a year. We did 1 billion a month. Um, so you, you see that phenomenal growth over a five year time span. That included networking and included all kinds of things. Um, you know, this guy was the limit for me because there was just so many opportunities. Um, and then it's funny, one day I talk about the magic HR fairy. She came around and tapped me on the shoulder with the magic wand and made me a manager one day because I was a great individual contributor. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's like, bling, you have eight direct reports, good luck. And, um, I naturally found myself having having a challenge. There were two people on my team who consumed most of my time as a manager, and I didn't know what to do without any formal management training. So I kind of naturally took on coaching with them. Hmm. So I've changed the names to protect the uh, protect the guilty. Uh, but Steve was and probably still is today the most technical person I've ever met. Uh, he had a legitimate photographic memory. So he was a network engineer. I could say, what does page 37, line 43 say? And without opening the book, he could tell me, that says plus or minus 12 volts DC at 30 amps. <laughs> like, what? How did you do this? But <laughs> as his manager, I was constantly involved, like many times a week, there was a conflict with there with him. He was what we would call a brilliant jerk. Um, there are other terms for it. I'll, I'll save you from those today. Um, but people would ask him questions and to him, they were stupid. Every question he ever got was stupid. So he would respond with offensive things. Um, and he would have a tone, even though he might answer the question very technically, he would have a tone of that was the dumbest thing you've ever said. Why did you bring this to me? Um, that spurred on two things. Sometimes the customers will come to me and say, I need Steve to work on this thing. Can you tell him to do it, please? <laughs> they wanted to communicate with me. Let me be the, you know, they, they, they ran away from him. The other situation was verbal altercation, <laughs> you know? So it, it was funny uh, being a brand new manager, not knowing what to do. I said, Steve, take your purchasing card go to the bookstore. This was in the days before Amazon. We went to book actual brick and mortar bookstores. I said, find a book on some skill that's not technical. Find a soft skill book and let's buy two copies. One for me, one for you. And we'll go through it because I need to learn this stuff too. And he comes back with Primal Leadership by Daniel Goleman, Harvard Business Press book, very cerebral book. And a, and a fantastic book, by the way. And we trudged through this book chapter by chapter. He was really not into it, just doing the bare minimum. And then one day we read a chapter on the amygdala and how the fight or flight response is triggered. That little almond in the back of your, your brain that triggers fight or flight. And he realized, he's like, oh my gosh, when I say things to people, I trigger that in them. I have the power that my words trigger a fight or flight response. Oh, that was like, that's very astute. Mean, 
and an illumination for him right it's like we really like we're getting into neuropsychology here like uh, um, i don't know anything about management but we're going to dive into neuropsychology <laughs> hey, <laughs> but great. you know daniel yeah. goldman really explained it well enough to where us lay people could understand that and that was a huge breakthrough for him um I'd be lying to you if I said he turned into Mr. Social overnight um, and became, you know, but he got better. He realized that, hey, I can improve this about myself. Um, he did go on to work for Microsoft, worked on the Exchange product team. Um, he, I don't think he would have done that if he didn't soften some of those things that he had. Right. And, and just to kind of break in here too, the, one of the things sure. that I've noticed in, I have a background in psychology, so this is easy for me to bring up things like this, but it, it seems to me that knowing the path and walking the path are sometimes a little bit different. And so you have to you know, walk the path sometimes before you know the path, which seems counterintuitive to an engineer type that wants to know first and then right. walk it. But sometimes we have to walk it out to know kind of the triggers in our minds. This is like, okay, when I'm about to say this in this way, uh -huh. that's going to cause this response. And, and we have to kind of walk through that a couple of times so we can know in advance kind of proactively okay, when I, I'm, I'm about to do this thing, I need to stop myself. And, and it just right. takes walking that out. So that's, that's really kind of an awesome story, though, that, that somebody could realize that, okay, this is why this is happening and want to change. I mean, I, I honestly, mm -hmm. most managers out there just have approached me with things like this person won't want to change. Mm -hmm. And I w wonder sometimes if they really gave them the chance. So that's really mm -hmm. cool that you were able to uh, kind of reach outside of the, the, the rope coaching and, and just say, okay, let's try a different approach. That's, that's really cool. I love that. Giving some of that autonomy, like you pick out the book, you pick out the subject because I need it too. I was there like willing to go alongside him, it, kind of that um, empathetic, you know, we're both going to struggle with this together. Let's do it. You know what I mean? That type of thing. So it's, it's really funny because there was an, an, an equal yet opposite reaction to my other team member who caused me a lot of problems. And that was, um, his name's Darren. Again, change the, change the names to protect the, uh, protect the guilty. <laughs> <laughs> um, senior network engineer. We were growing by leaps and bounds. And what I mean by growing, we were opening a new 250C office to process loans every month, pretty much. He was a senior network engineer, supposed to be putting networks in these new buildings. And he would miss deadlines. Uh, he would constantly be, for example, I caught him out fixing a person's printer in their desk. Like, what, like, Darren, what do you, what, what's going on? It was like, oh, she needed help with her printer. I'm like, we have, we have a team for that. We have, we have printer people. <laughs> you know, we, uh, this is not your thing. You're a senior network engineer. And um, right. I did the same thing with him. I didn't know what to do. And I just said, take your purchasing card, go buy two copies of the same book. And I remember sitting in a conference room waiting for him to come down the hall with the books. I didn't know what he bought, but I could see the yellow and black in his hands as he approached, as I looked through the window and it was time management for dummies, like the opposite book of what Steve picked, not cerebral, <laughs> like right. a dummies book, literally. And it was, you know, I almost laughed about it because it was, it was, it was how he wanted to approach it. And so what we very quickly realized going through this book he did not have a system at all. He didn't write anything down. He said yes to everything, never said no to anything. We had a really funny conversation where I was like, how do you delegate to other people? And he's like, You're, I'm, a, I'm not a manager. I don't delegate. I was like, well, that printer <laughs> should have been delegated to the right person. So much of this job is connecting the right people to who, to the, to the right resource. To the, Let's get the expert for that certain thing on the job. That's what we want. And so he slowly developed a system, developed his own thing and, um, you know, kind of solved that issue in his own way. And that made me realize that there's really a three part Venn diagram to technology effectiveness and technology effectiveness. Isn't just how much, you know, technically that's one of the three pieces. Um, Steve was very heavy on technology skill. Again, brilliant. Um, 
and he was a getting things done kind of person. If you, if I said, Hey, could you have that done Wednesday? He'd have it done for me Tuesday. He, he, he would just, he would just bust things out. He put his head down and make things happen. So he had his self-management under, you know, just nailed. Um, but where he was lacking was that understanding others, that empathy, the ability to communicate and understand others and where those three circles overlapped. He had one tiny little circle, two big ones still where they overlapped is still a very small area. Yeah. So as he grew that he increased his effectiveness, learning more technical skills would have been of no consequence to him. He needed these other things. Or even and worse we, consequence, actually, sometimes to, to learn too many right. technical skills, it just becomes right. like, you, you just kind of get lost in that. And it just right, becomes, right. you know, then he's super Bad. genius and no one can touch him. You know, no one can ever ask him anything. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and Darren had the opposite thing. His, his, he, he was the type of person that marketing department staff would invite them to their parties on the weekend. It doesn't happen in technology groups. <laughs> right. They don't usually blend, but he was so personable and understood other people. Whenever anybody asked him something that he had any clue about doing, he wanted to do it, but his self-management circle was just so small, limited his own effectiveness there. So um, I kind of naturally came into coaching and other things by the way my management style, just, I don't know what to do. We're going to do something. Let's I'll, jump in the trenches with you and, and we'll figure it out. So, yeah. Well, coaching ultimately at, at its core, good coaching anyway, is leadership. Um, and that's really like a big, a big Absolutely. piece of that. So that, that makes a lot of sense to me that, that in order to that now, not maybe not as a manager per se, not all managers are leaders. We know this, right. but a right. lot of times the, you know, people that are good at what they're doing as far as managing people know how to lead people, um, to, you know, not only have them serve well, but serve happily. <laughs> right, right. And that leads us down a whole nother conversation too. You know, the difference between management and leadership. I know mm. myself, I'm a better leader than I am a manager. Like if we were to break out, you know, if someone said, hey, pull up Microsoft Project and list out, uh, you know, a Gantt chart of, of this project, that is not where my best skills lie. I can do it, right. but there are many people who surpass me massively in their ability to manage work. And like, we're going to bring in this onboarding process and do this. And, you know, I'm going to put in the DevOps pipelines and, you know, like, Whoa, you go do that. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to go help right. people develop. <laughs> that's where, that's where I land. So I'm curious yeah. when you hear those two stories of Steve and Darren, like, do you have people in your life uh, that you met along with your career that were like that? And, um, just what are your observations there? Oh, positively. Uh, <laughs> in fact, um, well, along with the fact that um, I'm now thinking, gosh, I need to work harder at uh, getting uh, just do this into actual bookstores on the shelves because mm -hmm. people like Ken are actually uh, telling people to go buy two copies. Uh, that sounds like a great idea. So <laughs> yeah. two for that, one, you know, <laughs> but so honestly, hard. yeah, th there is, um, I don't want to call it a divide. Uh, but uh, this is something that we've talked about. Actually, um, episode six of Thrivecast that we did in June 4th of last year, uh, we talked a lot about, um, well, the concept was around performance reviews and how they were getting a little out of hand at some, in, in some cases and things like that. And, and it's like, we're not robots, we're, we're people in IT. Right. Um, and, and so it's, it's funny that, by means of evaluation, either person could be deemed as flawed, yet really neither were. It's just a matter of right. they weren't developed. And right. so that is really the, the thing that strikes me with that is that, you know, someone like uh, the Steve, mm -hmm. well, I mean, gosh, if I can count the number of people that are a lot like that, um, mm -hmm. And we call them brilliant. And a lot of times that's not the case. A lot of times they have knowledge that's keeping them uh, almost a prisoner um, because as the, the technology world moves forward, they know what they know. And so they're constantly having to you know, refresh that, get more information crammed into the head. And so they get frustrating very quickly, uh -huh. especially when it's older stuff that they feel like they've moved on from. Uh, right. So that, that could really... Um, do some things psychologically to, to make them feel like, you know, 
what are you, why are you asking me about that? Haven't we moved on from that, that sort of thing? These sort of things can happen. And it could easily feel to others like it's a superiority complex, you know, that, that you know, he thinks he's so much better, you know, and e even within IT departments, we see this all the time where there's the, you know, some people, the alpha personalities, you know, you know, I guess right. I wouldn't call it maybe, um, maybe Darren would be a little bit of an alpha personality, probably not necessarily, yeah. but, um, but the ones that are more sociable and kind of more bent towards leadership. And then there's those that are, you know, much more of the, you know, just lock them in a basement and let them go kind of right. things. Yeah. But hide them from all customers. <laughs> right. Yeah. And that's the right. thing is that, is that right. um, ultimately we find that um, neither are really right, but there are balance points in between mm -hmm. that, you know, we really need to learn how to be people and treat people as people. And so, right. you know, adapting and changing um, how we do that. And, and so on one hand, you have the, 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 the person like, like Steve that is very much driven by let's get it done the right way. And right. then you have people like Darren that are more of the, the people pleaser, you know, that, right. that go beyond. I, I think of um, it, it's kind of weird to see. Sometimes you see a blending of these two um, sure. in, um, in the Phoenix Project. Uh, uh, Gene Kim talks about that. Uh, as, a, as a character in there that is very much that um, I'll do it all. If anybody asks me anything, I'll just do it. And right. it ends up, you know, monkeying up the works because you can't just do everything in front of you. That's not, that's not how work works. <laughs> right. And so yeah. Brent, Brent becomes the, the squ squash point for every process and everything. He, everything's waiting on Brent and he's great. Yeah. He's amazing to work with, but everything's but, held up by Brent. <laughs> but Brent never takes a vacation and Brent right. is going to burn out and uh, go away. But there's a third thing about that, that Brent personality type. Let's just say that like it is. Uh, uh -huh. And that is that um, it's that need to feel needed. Absolutely. And I think a lot of times people miss that, that uh, that's kind of a third um, thing that we see in IT a lot of is mm -hmm. that people need to feel needed so they will hold on to things. Like you mentioned uh, early on, you had these older people <laughs> that right. are like the Novell experts and things like that. And, right, right. you know, I, I can count the number of uh, people early in my IT career, especially that, you know, we're literally doing things with punch cards and things like that. And, and yep held that over everyone's head as if they were, you know, somehow um, it was important. The reality is they had been used to so long doing things in a special way that nobody else could figure out uh -huh. so that they could maintain their sense of a job. And that comes from a sense of scarcity that, yep. that we see a lot of in information technology, which blows my mind that we have the especially in the wider sense of information technology. I mean, just in what I specialized in the last 20 years in, in uh, end user computing and, and kind of that, uh, mm -hmm. uh, some, some we call it server-based computing or whatever, but uh, honestly, the, the reality is that it's a huge demand field and there's no reason that any of us should fear having the ability to find work, right. but we do. We, we, we program ourselves to, to, to accept that reality. And so a lot of times what you'll find in that kind of, uh, archetype is the, the people that are very much um, I'll, I'll do it a special way and not tell anybody how I did it. So right. that way they can't fire me. Right. You know, that, that's another thing that this is super damaging. So uh, right. you find people like that, tell them to go buy my book. Yeah. That is a complete myth <laughs> that yeah. they're not going to be fired because no one understands that who's doing the firing anyways. <laughs> right. <laughs> Especially yeah. big corporations. Uh, I also find in, in, in coaching individuals, and I can think of a couple of people I'm coaching right now who are staff level, principal level engineers. You know, they're as mm -hmm. high as technically as they're going to go in their in their current companies that are in this, you know, they know everything about their current on-premise stuff and their company's going to the cloud, right? And they need to be cloud engineers now. And they're resisting it with every fiber of their being. And I'm asking why. I'm like, why do you resist this new technology? And it's that fear. It's that mm -hmm. I am an expert here and I don't want to be the new person here. I'm like, really, it's an AWS. It's an S3 bucket. Yeah, it's not like file storage. It's different. <laughs> but you have the skills to translate mm -hmm. to learn that so much faster. But they see 
young people um, up and coming know it much better than them and that scares them away and yeah. it's frightening for them and i'm encouraging them to just dive in head first and letting their experience drive them um you know and and inform those things and they become better cloud engineers because i'm hearing things in the industry that you know old school engineers can't be cloud engineers you got to start over you can't you, you can't educate them and i am like mm. that's bull <laughs> yeah complete. <laughs> i don't believe it i don't no, believe it because i've done it you mm. know what i mean it's um you know, get people the right training, get them the right resources, give them the incentive to do it, um, mm-hmm. you know, all those things and give them the freedom to do it. Because sometimes we bog them down with the, the the old school stuff and we, you know, free up the, the, the up and comers to to learn that stuff when they're the ones that need to be freed up. So um, yeah. it's a whole interesting thing to, to coach people on. And so much of it, is is mindset i worked at a company i worked for a consulting company for a while and they were like you have got to learn this cloud stuff and because they were telling me it was like a high school math teacher or a english teacher making me read a book i hated it you know what i mean i hated every second right. of it but they approached it like you have to learn this or you're not going to work here anymore and to me that was like that's not how growth happens this you know like i need to own that i need to uh, I, I need to absorb it i need to make the decision that it's right for me and so incentivize me to do it you know enable me to do it don't mandate um those 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 pieces of psychology are really interesting and in in leadership I, I won't say management because it's really not a management function it's a leadership function you know hey who wants to learn this cloud technology? Here's a, a cloud guru account. Anybody want to do this? Who can get certified first? You know, like <laughs> that's a totally different than everybody in my staff needs to be certified by this date or else. Yeah. It's a whole different approach. And I, I yeah. see people doing it both ways. And it's like, look which one's more effective. Whenever I've encountered people that are resistant to change or, and we're seeing this now with the cloud for sure. Uh, yep. Because there's so much dynamic about it that we're seeing this a lot. But I have to say that every time I've seen a team resistant to the cloud, I take a, a wider look, just kind of pull the, pull the lens back a little bit and, and zoom out. And mm-hmm. what I usually see is there's a culture of mandates. And right. so it is like, this is just one of many mandates that they had no say in whatsoever. They weren't uh-huh. participating in the conversation. It's just, it feels like, oh, somebody read this in Forbes. So now we're doing it. Right. You know, that, that's the perception a lot of the times. Because a lot of times that's exactly true. You know, uh-huh. Or you know, we, somebody played golf with somebody and now all of a sudden we have this software. You know, that right. happens too. And so there's a cultural thing too that, that, that honestly, if IT people want to change that, they have to start having the conversations uh-huh. with management and have those, have those lunches. Have those, you know, uh-huh. coffee or after hours, or whatever, get to know what their challenges right. are and why, you know, if uh-huh. it starts with why it, it always does. If there's any kind of change that comes down the pipeline, it's, it's usually to either save money or make uh-huh. money. Right. Right. So absolutely. We don't see that in it all the time. So a lot of times there's that perspective of things too, is like, if you, if you can actually look at, well, like Steve did look, look at, things from the other person's perspective and see their pain points and see how they can respond to that more appropriately Then that unlocks a whole new method of success that has nothing to do with what you know for of technology. Right. Uh, I I see this all the time in sales engineering, actually, where people Uh wonder how in the world did, and I can say this now that my sales engineer co-host isn't with me today, I can, I can say these (laughs) things, but People wonder, like, how in the world did this person get to this, this position of, of uh-huh. doing this? And the reality is that they, they realize that, well, I don't have to know everything. I just have to know someone who does. Yep. Mr. Google knows everything. You know, this, is, this is how to be successful. And that's, that's, that's the hidden secret for, for technology success. Right. But someone still has to be there and, and interpret you know, what's going on and, and be the one that's actually putting it all together. And that's, that's where, yeah, I like that, that concept of that coaching it through it. And I'm curious, how is it that you managed to find companies that 
do this because my experience has been that uh, a lot of companies are not open to to having uh, either managers or people that are specifically there to coach uh, and, and lead teams uh, yep. with that mindset. What, what is it you think is, is the difference maker there? What, what, what cultural difference is there uh, with those, those organizations? That's a really good question. Uh, and uh, it's, it's one I'm still striving to unlock. <laughs> mm-hmm. However, I have noticed a pattern. Every company says they're people first. Just look around. They are all people first. We're a company made up of people. And then you mm-hmm. look at their actions. Do their actions align with people first? And oftentimes they're not. You know, they might be very metric heavy. You you need to meet these OKRs or SLAs or whatever the you know current nomenclature is for for whatever they're measuring. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I was I was standing in a conference room eating cake, celebratory cake at a company, and we were celebrating the fact that our IT service desk had dropped 30%. We had 30% less issues come into the service desk over the past year because of all of these new processes and procedures we put in. I asked a really hard question. Did less people call the help desk because they made it more difficult to work with? And it was exactly yes, the answer. But we were celebrating with cake that we had done a great thing. We made drive-bys go way up because people didn't want to call the help desk because they were a pain. (laughs) But yet we looked only at the metrics and there was no, so that company also called themselves people first. So, you know, you have to, you have to evaluate both the actions and then ask, are your actions actually making things better for people or are they making things more challenging for people? And then you, you find, when you see that alignment, then you know that companies are there. Um, I'm in discussions with a, a CIO of a large um, hospital organization and he, you know, absolutely my team needs this, you know, we've done personality profiling, we've done some of this individual stuff. We need, my staff needs some of these soft skills and, and bring those in. And, you know, in the conversations we're having, I had to really ratchet back the basics because of, you know, some of the stories he's telling me, like basic, like, human interaction stuff like it's we're not we're not talking about advanced things here um you know it also depends on how management views the organization or maybe even the executives of an organization view technology is technology an asset that helps them be more profitable or is it a line item on the balance sheet that is in the liabilities category um just that basic executive level thing can make the difference between somebody wanting someone like me to work there or someone to be a manager and get the things done that we said we're going to do. You know what I mean? Like it's really an interesting thing. I'm really trying to unlock it because like I said, you know, people, everybody's a people first company, you know, we're a company made of people. We're a people first company, but then (laughs) we do things that, that don't align to it. Yeah, I saw a, um, well, we shouldn't name names, but but it's a, they make beer. It's a beer company mm-hmm. that uh, was talking about being planet first. Mm-hmm. And I was like, you make beer, you're not planet first, right? <laughs> That's not your driving factor right, here. Right, right. You all natural. About, yeah, it, is yeah, all it might be all natural. <laughs> you know, it's not first. It's not the right, first right. thing you're concerned about. Let's, right. let's, yeah, the, yeah, the, the, uh, the the uh get the shovel is, is what right. i usually say about that but yeah it's true though i mean there's a well knowing people by the fruits of their spirit is the way sure. i always put that and that's really true with this kind of thing that's that's really an astute observation that you need to take a step back and and, and look at you know, what it actually is and mm-hmm. I, I encourage this a lot of times in the technology world even you know to to take a step back and like I say, and like look at things from, from a overall overview standpoint and saying, what's the, what's the, what is the driving force? And is that being met? Sure. And a lot of times you find, yeah, that's, that's not true. Like they're, they're, uh-huh. they're, they're focused on the wrong things and that gets into a consulting mindset, but you, you don't need a consulting mindset or experience with that to realize that 
Uh -huh. Somebody's not meeting up to what their vision is. It's easy enough yep. to see. <laughs> so yep. but that's, that's, that's actually good. Um, in my mind, I, I hate to be this, this um, bold about this at times, but I think people should really choose employers based on that. Not just that there's a job offer in front of them. Like your health yep. benefits are one thing, but if you're driven insane and, and you, you know, put yourself in the hospital because your job is driving you crazy, those health benefits, you know, right. are being used the wrong way. <laughs> it's like, I bought this car because it has the best warranty, but it's in the shop once a month. Probably yeah. not the greatest purchase. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Even though you don't have to pay for the repairs, you still don't have the use of your vehicle while it's in the shop. But it, it's funny, you mentioned... Um, not, you know, how do people get to a place, you, you talk of your co-host, your, your your sales engineer, how do you get to a place where you have that base level of skill set and mm -hmm. can just adapt very quickly because you have those things? Have you seen the TV show Ted Lasso? I have not. It is phenomenal. I highly recommend it. It is very much a lesson in leadership. Um, basic premise of the show is a college football as in you know tackle football coach gets hired by a, a british uh english premier league soccer team to coach them for the specific purpose of the lady who owns it now divorced her ex-husband and his only thing he ever loved and she wanted to get back at him so she wanted to ruin it well he comes in jason sudeikis plays the lead he comes in with such a positive leadership thing. He doesn't know anything about soccer. And he's just like, we're going to get better every day. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And he just puts on a clinic on how, how not positive, not toxic positivity, but real life. Like we're going to oh, yeah. improve a little mm -hmm. bit every day. Um, we're going to believe that we can do it. We're more capable than we imagine, uh, you know, all these things. And he does it in like this lovable huckster thing. It's a phenomenal show. I've literally watched the whole season three times and it's been out five months. I don't know, nice. <laughs> <laughs> but there's so many, so many layers to it and complexity of it. Uh, it's really good. And, 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 and that is a great metaphor for, you know, how can somebody pick up a new technology and just run with it and learn it very quickly? Mm -hmm. Well, you, you you take all the lessons you've learned before and keep building on them. You don't have to yeah. wipe the slate clean and start from scratch. You know a lot. Um, you know, no. you know, you might work on a SAN in on premise, and you might be working in you know S3 structures. Well, what's the difference? Well, you, you know, put together a chart real quick on what the differences are, and you can find out like, oh, those things are different. You know. Um, and and here's how we manage access. We man, you know, all the same things are there. They're just other people's computers you know that's what the cloud is it's not yeah. intimidating it's other Someone people's system and other people's rules you just got to learn the, the nomenclature and the and the and the fundamentals to get around yeah. it so well you also just made me realize something about this too that uh it might be almost almost marketing-esque but <laughs> it's it's true and yeah. that is that in the technology world there's literally only one thing that you can learn and invest in that will carry from job to job. And that is your soft skills. You know, right. your methodology may change a little bit, but, uh -huh. but those, that, that kind of mindset, the way you approach things and the way you are around other people, that's one thing you can carry from job to job. And so, right. gosh, it seems like a good investment to me. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's funny how we've stigmatized and, and this has been in the technology industry, even in, even in big companies like Netflix and Google and Amazon, it happens that the people who need the coaching the most are the people who aren't getting the job done. And mm. that is a very bad myth. Um, some of the people I've coached and some of the people that I know of other coaches have coached, the really successful folks take coaching and just blow up, you know, like success wise. And you're like, all it took was that you know, one or two conversations or that six month engagement or this or that. And they really see a huge benefit. So, you know, you, a lot of times people are like, yeah, that guy over there, he's the one that needs the help, not me. 
but we all could benefit from it. I have a coach. I love my coach. Um, yep. His name's Robbie. He's in the UK, which makes things a little tough for me scheduling with him. But, <laughs> you know, I, I have an engagement with him. It has a finite mm -hmm. term. I'm going to get a lot out of it and I'm going to move on and find another coach and I'm going like, to keep learning and growing from that. So, and, and I know you've, you've worked with a lot of different coaches as well. And, and yeah. I'm guessing you, you will continue to, to change it up because you learn so many things from this and then so many things over here and, and keep going. That's true. And, and different things from different folks for sure. But um, for me, coaching is very much, you know, let's, let's dial in the mindset. Let's, let's make sure that you're not stuck, you know, getting right. unstuck is probably the, the main thing when it comes to uh -huh. uh, coaching that I invest in. And there's probably a difference for people too. I, I think that that should be clear too, that, there's, a, there's coaching that you invest in and then there's coaching that your company might invest in. And there's different goals you know, when yep. it comes to that. Sometimes you'll have you know, personal goals that you want to achieve, but sometimes it literally is just personal, maybe not goals, but you know that, that things could be better. And so you invest in yourself in that regards. Um, right. our, our friend, um, I, I think he was there the year you were there at Tribe, uh, but Dan Miller uh, uh -huh. has said to me that if you're not investing at least 10% of your income back into your own personal development, then you are falling behind. You know, Absolutely. I actually push that a little further. I, I think people should be in, if they can get to that point of investing more like 30% in their own uh -huh. personal development, then yep. what they see on the, uh, the backside of that is a increase in their revenue that they just didn't realize it's almost magic how that happens. Right. And so uh -huh. having that combination of, you know, just treating it as a, you know, this is an investment in myself. I'm going to improve, you know, right. goals are, are great. Uh, but if you don't have a, a context for those goals, then they're just goals, you know? And so, yeah. Having somebody else working with you is important. I would build on that even more. And that is mm -hmm. not just invest the money. It's gotta be that full, like all in commitment. One of my favorite coaching questions is like, what would, what would all in look like for you? What if you went all in on some, whatever, whatever it is, what, what would that look like? Because oftentimes I know with myself and I know with other people like coach, you know, we're, we're committed to things, but we're not all in on them. Yeah. What if we went all in and I'm talking to myself cause I need to do it <laughs> cause I still hold back. Um, you know, Marsha Shander, who you know, um, she does this, the, the talk, um, she did it at Tribe, um, mm -hmm. but the recording I found of it is at World Domination Summit. She talks about the beast. Mm -hmm. And uh, she talks about a way to manipulate the beast. And she's hilarious. She's a storytelling coach. She teaches people how to tell stories. And um, she talks about the beast in, in very blunt terms. Like it even inf interferes with her dating life when she was dating. She said, the beast says things like, you have a face that no one likes. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. wow, like that. So I've learned from, from Marsha that I have that thing too, that's telling me to hold back. It's telling me, don't get yourself disappointed. Don't get mm -hmm. yourself hurt. Don't go all in on something. And this is kind of funny because he's staring at me right here. I have my beast. He's in a jar. Oh, <laughs> nice. So first off, I have the, you know, Marsha suggested, here's how to manage him. You notice the mm -hmm. beast. You understand he's trying to help you. You acknowledge that he's there. Thank you for trying to help me, beast, but I don't need you right now. Mm -hmm. And then you push through. Well, I drew him out. He's a little, he's kind of cute, but there's my beast. He's the one that holds me back. And he stares at me up to the right of my desk because when I hear those negative, like, you know, hold back a little bit. You don't want to get disappointed. You don't want to have dis. you know, you, 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 the things you want, you know, they're, they're not real, you know, mm -hmm. that's my beast. <laughs> and he, he's probably, he's in a jar. He's harmless. He's kind of cute actually, you know, but um, it's funny. Those are the types of things that help, help us get out of that mindset. And it's funny talking to a group of technologists about some arts and crafts project I did in the corner of my office, but it works for me. <laughs> but yeah, well, uh, and you can find the things that work for you. And that's another, you know, that is another doubt that um, we've been working through mm -hmm. that uh, when we first started thrive it uh, and started the, the thrive cast. Uh, well, yeah, we didn't have a name for it yet. Uh, mm -hmm. But back in that point, 
we were concerned that that people weren't going to want to talk about you know people stuff you know sure. we'd only mm-hmm. seen like technology web web webinars about the technology and we just talked right, about right. tech 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 and there weren't really any outlets and so we were concerned that you know well it's that old saying you know um you know pioneers get shot and settlers get rich right <laughs> so right. it's very true absolutely yeah. pioneer yeah uh, yeah that's okay uh, but what we're seeing now is um these conversations are happening you know uh-huh. that we're seeing um wider conversations going on and so that 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 was part of our beast was uh-huh. okay it, you know uh nobody's yeah, nobody's viewing. No, nobody's nobody's tuning in. You know, there's not right, a lot right. of subscribers. You know, that, that sort of thing. If it was and, a good idea, other people would have been doing it. You know, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah things those like those that. things that just don't really. Bad. Everybody has a podcast. This one's not going to make a difference. It, like yeah. those things are all lies. Yeah, and, and ultimately, it's, and, it's but they're loud. Know, they are loud, they're really and, loud. And I'll be, you know, completely transparent with people, and that there's you know, a lot of things that that I definitely struggle with. Um, um, and I can pretty much guarantee you that every person who's ever written a book has gone through this, Absolutely. whether or not they publish it or not. In fact, most yep. people don't ever publish. You know, they'll, mm-hmm. there, there is libraries upon libraries full of, you know, ideas that no one will ever see, you know, unpublished material uh, Absolutely. because of this beast. Because of, oh, well, you know, nobody's going to buy your book. Nobody cares. Somebody else has it covered. You know, I hear this all the time in the technology world when it comes to blogs and things like that, too. Oh, no, no. Somebody, somebody else has that covered. I did that for quite a lot. I, I, right. My blog is kind of pathetic, really. It's just a, it's a hodgepodge <laughs> of various things that I put together, and I haven't actually put anything out for quite some time. Yep. But that's part of that beast. It's like, oh no, you know what? Yeah, there's other people that have covered this. They're doing fine. Uh, maybe I'll just point to them, and then I you know, rarely ever do. You know that sort of thing. Right. It's it's one of those gotchas that uh-huh. that'll, that'll that's a gotcha that'll get you. Uh, yep. But the honest truth is, you no, know, the world needs your voice about it. And right. if you aren't yet, like for me, like when I'm going through times like this year, where you know. Everybody was excited about the books. Everybody tells me how great they are. But then I look at the uh, the numbers and I'm like, well, I guess everyone who's excited either bought it or got it for me from free for free. And uh, that's it. Yeah. That's <laughs> right. But what's the problem there? It's it's yeah, not yeah. what it, the perception is that, oh, no, you just you did a bad job. Nobody cares. Nobody's going to buy this. That's the perception. Uh-huh. Then I look at the reality. It's like, well, how many people have actually heard about it? Right. Well, that's where we started getting into a little bit of a challenge because I'm like, well, I can't honestly say that a lot of people have even heard about this book, you know, right. to, to even know about it. You know, it's, it's, it's one of those honest truths that, you know, we have to be realistic about it. So not everybody, not everything is for everyone. Right. But there are people out there that need this. And I, I knew it to be true and uh-huh. it's still true. So it's a Absolutely. matter of just hanging in there and really getting into it with, with uh, yourself about that and you know, i right. love love marsha love, love what she said about the the I, I'm, I'm hearing that talk in my mind too uh right, right. it'd be great her, to um, her uh, uh spotify playlist yeah <laughs> that's not safe for work but not safe for work, but awesome yeah i'm, I'm yeah. gonna make a note too um, to uh put the link in the episode that'd be great for other people to check out because it's definitely worth um worth seeing i recommend it to a lot of people um, do you mind if I put my coaching hat on for a minute and 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 give you an observation? You should, yeah. Okay. So just earlier we talked about OKRs and performance reviews, and you said you had an episode about it. I, I haven't heard it, but um, mm-hmm. I I hear you talking about your own book in those OKR terms. Right. How many did you sell? How many did this? What's the better question? What impact did it make? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because if you sold a million books, that'd be great. It'd be great for your bank account. However, what if everybody said, this was a piece of garbage? Right. I didn't get anything out of this book. Every single person. <laughs> that, would, that wouldn't make you feel great. It'd be good for your bank account, but not exactly the metric you want, right? Hey, man, I'm, I'm still so looking what, for that person that gave me a four-star review instead of a five-star review. I'm still, <laughs> I'm going to find you. I'm kidding. It wasn't me. Completely I promise. I promise. kidding. Um, 
<laughs> that's awesome. But you, you see what you see where you're going there. It's easy to get caught up in those like so easy. The, those are the easy metrics because mm -hmm. there's a spreadsheet that tells me how many I've sold. But what you don't understand, and I am telling myself this 100. percent So as you know, I haven't published on my blog for many months, and it's like nobody's reading it. I mean, this, you know, but. Um, in that meantime, someone found it. I got picked up to be published in a book on by O'Reilly. You know, one mm -hmm. chapter of one book about vulnerability in technology. Um, if, if I need to get back to it, obviously, because it's making an impact. It's, you know, I don't know how many books are being sold. I don't get that metric because it's not my book, right? <laughs> which is great. Um, but I know that I've had three people two on Twitter, one on LinkedIn. I'm sorry, I got that backwards. One on Twitter, two on LinkedIn that have reached out to me directly and said, I read this and I've never heard anybody talk about vulnerability in technology before. And when you're on an outage bridge to be like, hey, it must've been me. Well, it might've been me. Maybe it's probably me. You know, <laughs> if, if everybody approached an outage that way, how fast would problems mm -hmm. be solved? But yep. if we all approach them with, it's not my stuff. It's not my stuff. I'm not taking the heat for this one. I'm not doing it. It delays. It delays things. But if we all approach it with vulnerability and like excited to find out if it's me or not, yes. then we it really changes the way we operate and how much we enjoy our work too. You don't have the blame game anymore when you're when you're playing in that kind of space. There's no you know there's no dunce hat that someone needs to wear or the uh, team award for making the most cowboy move. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny you say that because literally episode two, um, my co-host Jeff talks about why I don't know is the smartest thing you can say in IT. Absolutely. And it, it is that vulnerability. So yeah, absolutely. That, that, that's, that's a difference maker. And then that, that being excited to find out if you were wrong, that's mm -hmm. just such a weird thing for people to, to hear, but it's so necessary for people to hear, you know, right. it's, it's, it's hard to accept correction, but especially when the correction is coming from a, an area you didn't expect. Right. And, you know, so it's, I, I, I completely agree that the, those metrics and things like that, that, that are easy to, I mean, if you ask me today, you know, well, actually you could ask me any day, how many copies that I've sold. And I can tell you, I don't know. Uh -huh. I don't know. Um, it's the same with sending emails to people. Um, it always right. feels like it's a, a burden. You know, all I see is the, cause when you send out just for those that are not familiar, uh, when you have a, a system like ours and we send out emails to our subscribers, uh, and if you're not a subscriber, you shall totally should be one, uh, <laughs> but we'll send out things that we compose that we think are going to be helpful for people. And then right. we see how many people unsubscribed. Mm -hmm. And so that makes us less likely to want to send out anything more. So right. the, uh, I call this, uh, you know, use, use another uh, biblical example is kind of like, you know, my Sunday school brain, I guess. But uh, uh, there's that, that, the story is of, 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 you know, Jesus leaving 99 sheep to, to go find one, you know, that sort of thing. Uh -huh. So that's, right. that's kind of like me, you know, doing kind of a opposite effect of that, uh, of, of leaving the, leaving everyone for the wrong reason. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's, it's probably right. not the best analogy, but, but you get the point. It's it like, totally, it totally is. And, and Seth Godin said it's differently, but he also says, if you, if you make content for everyone, like you try to cast a wide net, mm -hmm. you actually make content for no one. He's like, you need to make content for that one person. You need to help one person and helping one person and sharing it with more will actually increase. So who, who's in mind, you know, who yeah. is that person that needs help? Who is that person who, who needs to hear the words that only you uniquely can, can bring to so them I, I did, because you have your own experiences and filter that through. Yeah. So there's an experience too of, of not making assumptions. Uh, assumption is, well, I say all the time that assumption is one of the most dangerous forces in information technology, but it's also sure. true, you know, just in general, but right. I'll tell you a story about some of these unsubscribes that I found recently. Um, so I started looking into it and I saw somebody that I know has told me that, that they, that they get value out of the emails that I sent. So it's like, why did they unsubscribe all of a sudden? I don't get this. Well, right. it turns out they had subscribed on their personal address and their work address, they were unsubscribing with their work address. Ah. So it, it's kind of one of those things where it just caught me off guard. I was like, Oh, seriously, I'm, right. I'm sitting here like thinking, I'm Oh my gosh, so with one with of me. my best fans. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I would tell you a story about this too. And then this is, a, this is important for, for, for me to hear myself saying as well. 
there was a, a conference a year ago, a little more than that, January of uh, 2020, just before the, the lockdowns and all that kind of stuff. And someone approached me and said, wow, you know, I, I, I really appreciate your emails. You know, I, I appreciate them, you know, just, just from a, the way you talk kind of thing, uh -huh. you know, and it was, it was nice to get perspective on that. Um, at that same conference, uh, somebody was uh, approaching me with, um, I, think, I can't remember exactly what the question was or, or whatever it was, but, but the end result was that, that I encouraged them to go ahead and do like we're saying, just, just publish something, you know, it doesn't have to be great. You know, right. it just has to be done. It just has to be you. Um, and so uh, they, they pinged me on LinkedIn the other day and let me know that they've, they've done that. Right. That's awesome. That's and so it's, it's like what you're saying about, you know, when you get focused on the wrong things, you know, the, the metrics, you know, the, all those kind of things that, that, you know, in the end are the easy way out, you know, the, uh -huh. the, the easy way, but it, it blinds us to the, the impacts we're actually having. And so I've, I, I have written down, um, some people are familiar with like Tony Robbins. Um, uh -huh. and, um, I was going through just of writing down, you know, what is important and, and what are, you know, in five-year goals and 10-year goals and all that kind of stuff is, is great. But in, in writing down, you know, what is important about this? What impact do I want to have? And I started to think about, well, gosh, if, if people put into practice what I did uh -huh. and they have the same impact or more or even less than I had, right? you put that at scale right. and... If I impact that with a thousand people, well, then I have generated well over a million dollars each year in difference in people's families. Right. Um, and actually the math in that was a hundred people actually, <laughs> just a right. hundred. And so I was like, well, gosh, what can we, how can we make that a, a billion? You know, it's, right. it's, like, it's like, it it becomes that, that thing you get excited about as far as numbers go, but, but the, but the difference maker, you know, that, that we were able to get out of debt, that we were able to, you know, invest in, in certain things and get us set up to be able to weather certain storms like we're in right now, that sure. sort of thing. These are all things that, that happened because I stepped outside of myself and, and said, okay, you know, I'm going to try these new things and get better about these things and want to improve. And so Absolutely. as a consultant, the better I got, the more I got paid. Right. Go figure. But it wasn't about my technology. I didn't get any better. In fact, I got worse at the technology. <laughs> right. uh, that's, that's the truth. That's the, that's, that's, that's the irony. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, 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 I quick wrote the book before I got really bad at the technology. Um, right. <laughs> But it's true. Yeah, I, I totally agree. The 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 further I get from technology, the 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 details of you know this is how that I is dotted and that T is crossed, the more I'm in demand. It's weird. Yep. No, it's true. <laughs> I can I can tell you more about cryptocurrency right now than I can than I can tell you about how VMware is working right now. Yeah, this is this <laughs> that's the reality of of these situations. Sometimes you just kind right. of. One one fascinating thing that that occurs to me since you've mentioned this, and it's a thing I've learned since the pandemic was was the replication rate of a virus. You know, you look at this, and it's like, oh, if it stays above one, then it's going to grow logarithmically. If it stays below one, then it's going to die out. And it's like, wait a minute, that could be applied to this as well. Like, if I write a blog and more than one person reads it, even if it's like if I publish four in a month and one time two people read it and the rest of the time one person, that's replication. Like it's a yep. replication thing. It's the message you're getting out there and it can go like this in a blink of an eye. I mean, you, you see the numbers where the, the, the positivity rate shot up is because one person passed it to four people who passed it to eight people mm -hmm. who passed it to 32, you know, like it's just massive numbers instantly. So it can happen. You know, Seth Godin, I've mentioned him a couple of times, his book, The Dip, really illustrates that because it's like you have all this energy, everything's great when you first start, and then you there's this dip where your energy, you know, no one, no one's gonna read this, no one's gonna no one's gonna buy my woodworking, no one's going to do this thing. Yep. Um, and that's the dip you have to get through um, because it's always closer than you think. And yes, I am talking to you, Ken, and not you, DJ, but <laughs> This is a, a nice self-reflection. I like it. Thanks for creating the space for me. 
it's diversity in experiences and things like that, you know, but if you don't do it, then you won't have it. Um, and exactly. so it's, it's not like you need to be the best at everything. Mm-hmm. Um, right. But if you don't try, then how are you possibly going to know what, right. you, what excites if, you? How are you going to know what lights you up if you don't try it? If no one ever wrote anything until they were the absolute expert at writing, then we would have no books ever. We would have no right. TV shows. We would have no movies. We would have no, no content at all. <laughs> and the, 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 I was just going to say something about the, about the content element of this. It was actually my coach um, that, that said this to me, you know, the fragrance craft said this to me. He said, DJ, you're, you're a uh, brilliant content creator. And that was something that I had not had as an identity. No. And, nice. and so it was one of those things where it's like, huh? Yeah. So that's an affirmation. Yeah. That's, that's an affirmation. So I wrote that down and put that into think up and that's part of my identity now. And yep. I think about that. Like if I didn't have that identity, if I, I wasn't okay with that, then would I have like, I have a one note open right now on the screen. That's just below you. Uh, you can't see it, Ken, but it's there. Uh, but <laughs> I'll trust you. Trust but it, you. it is a, a a kind of a reference point of these episodes. That's why I'm bringing them up so fast because I've I keep this up. Is that I know over the course of conversations that things come out, and it just occurred to me that there have been six different instances today where I have given out content that I've created to people. You know, some yep. of which was created way back in like 2018, uh, uh-huh. but but there have been that many instances today, and I've only had like two meetings today. So it, right. it's like one of those things where it's, it comes up, but right. if you if you don't do it, then how's that going to be, you know, how are you going to have that in your quiver, so to speak, you know, right. but the impacts though, that's, that's the important thing. So yep, it's yep. done once and all of a sudden I'm able to, to spread that out. And so that's the cool thing about uh, content creation and that's great for mindset stuff. And that's, that's where I, where I live these days, but mm-hmm. it's also good for the technology world. Um, I think of, well, just the cloud in general the cloud would probably not be possible if it weren't for a lot of collaboration that happened because of blogs and things like that. Uh, right. some, some ideas sprung out of these things and they get better and better and better. Well, if, if nobody was publishing these things, then they wouldn't be out there. And so right. it, it, every company would just have their own little ideas and they might get implemented. They might not, but they wouldn't grow with each other. And that's, that's what's made, Right. Things accelerate so much in the last few years as people are sharing ideas and sharing content and it's, it's really crucial. So as far as it goes, everybody needs to be out there doing it. (laughs) Absolutely. And I don't have anything to teach, you know, like teach the very basic stuff that you learned many years ago that there are many people who don't know it. Um, there's a lady named yeah. Julia. I can't, her name escapes me. I will send you the link to add it to the notes, but she draws these little zines on like the ping utility, ARP, you know, like all these little things, like here's all the different command switches you could use for these command line tools. And oftentimes I'll look at them being a veteran of the industry. Like I've used those tools my whole life. And I never knew that was an option. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's not, she's essentially like illustrating man pages on the Unix platform. And it's like, but they're brilliant and they work really well. And she passes them around. Um, I, I don't know her. I, I, I met her on Twitter, you know, um, right. just, you know, sent her, sent her a couple of messages saying her stuff is, is brilliant. And that's, you know, she just started out. I think her first one was like on ping, you know, like here's how to use the tool ping. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's amazing um that, that what she can create and every single person can do that and if no one reads it or you never know of anybody reading it you might have become a better writer better communicator yeah. you might have uh, improved in ways that are intangible um but getting better every day is uh, is, is one of your taglines i won't steal it from you <laughs> yeah absolutely <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and we always want to advise people too. like, make sure if you're writing about something that's happening at your, at your, at your company, that you have yep. permission to do that. That's very important, yeah. but right, right. it's, a, you know, <laughs> or anonymize oh, it a lot. I'll get myself in trouble for saying <laughs> this, but, but if you don't have permission, you might be in the wrong company. Yeah. That's what I'll say about that. Uh, we, we can just say it that way. Uh, but, but by and large, mm-hmm. you know, be willing to do it. You know, and, yep. and even if it's just done internally, uh, this, this comes up, this came up in a conversation the other day, actually, 
about, you know, internal documentation, that sort of thing, and how important that is. And having that willingness to do that, you know, is, is sometimes a challenge for people. And sure. the, the successful companies are those that actually set out a, a time frame to say, okay, here's 30 minutes at the end of the day to you know, get this all done. You know, right. You know, this is this is the time to do this. And it's all we're allowing you to do at that time. Just document your day. Tell us the story of your day. You know, right. Just that simple. Well, the more you do that, the more you get better at writing and, the, and communicating. Um, and we got to say too, like, like you're saying, not all communication is written. Um, just we're saying this in big ways right now that uh -huh. we're doing things with video, right? You know, that's crazy. Why are you doing things with video DJ? That's nuts. That's so much work. Yes. Right. Yes, it is. But the thing is I'm finding it easier to do things with video than I am uh, with the, just writing a blog. It's easier for me to turn on the camera and start recording than it is yep. to type out a blog and worry about my words. And, you know, it's, it's kind of one of those things where there's a level of vulnerability that I'm finding with this kind of communication where people can see, I'm looking right at them. You know, it's, right. it's, it's huge. So there's right. that too, but yeah, it's just a matter of finding out what works for you and, and do it. So it's just a matter of experimenting and not getting discouraged. Just, you know, there's not a blog out there that you just, publish it and magically people are finding your article it doesn't work like that you right know, you have to actually do the other thing which is to share what right. you create and be vulnerable and be you know uh, there's a there's a fake fake resilience which is just fake manliness fake fake boldness that uh, your words don't matter to me and then the real resilience which is like we just keep striving we keep striving and you know things are hard and things are tough and sometimes things are great and we keep striving and and keep that up so another great trait of of good technologists is is not just your technical skills but can you see a project through you know like that is a unknown skill so many people run into the beginning of an exciting project with new technology and they're ready to go but crossing that last finish line is really hard for a lot of people because <laughs> yeah. it requires discipline it requires um you know getting up for something you don't necessarily feel excited about anymore and other things so it's interesting and um you know i would encourage people to seek out coaches um both dj and i do coaching but mm -hmm. seek out a coach around you um you know find somebody you're comfortable with i am not a great coach for everyone i am sure dj you would agree that you're not a great coach for everyone but there are people who i coach who you know it's a, it's a really good match yeah and we can really um help them go further but if you're stagnant and you're not growing a little bit every day time to do some self-examination and see if that's something for you. Um, you know, there are organizations like, like better up who do, you know, coaching at a very commoditized level. Um, and there are people who do it very custom. Um, so seek out, seek out those ones that work for you. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's very important. Um, so like, I'm not, I'm not always the best career coach, for example, you know, I'm not, I'm not the right person to give, well, I'm not always good at advice, even though uh -huh, uh -huh. You know, it seems like I would be, but I'm not always good at it. You know, it, it's, yep. a, it's not always my thing, but, but, you know, seeing blind spots, for example, that's kind of one of those things where I just, I, 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 yep. I have a boldness you know, when I see something, I say something, <laughs> right. Uh, but it's that, that intuition that I, that I kind of rely on. There's no, there's no methodology for that, by the way, it's, it's just yep. something. That, so yeah, you have to find the right coach that works for you. Absolutely. It's, it's super okay. important. A great coach should help you see the world differently than you see it today because we get stuck in, and maybe not physically stuck, maybe we're growing every day and we're still limited by some things that we don't know that we believe, you know, and like you might be challenged by someone who asks you a really hard question that you never really realized you thought about it in a way, you know, like, um, you know, my coach asked me, like, what do you want? And then it was like, what do you really want? And mm -hmm. then again, like, what do you really, really, really want? And I realized some of the things I said initially were so superficial, they didn't actually really even matter. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, and it took going deeper and deeper into that to actually find out what my true, uh, you know, uh, actually, if I got that, I would just actually be unfulfilled and wanting the next thing. Um, so actually, what is 
what what are those things and there's a contrast here it. sometimes too like i i found two things one was a a bunch of things that i wrote down when i went through 48 days to the work you love by dan miller um and i wrote those down 10 years ago and nice. i looked at that list and i'm like oh, gosh i wouldn't even accept some of these things today so the things that were <laughs> dreams for me 10 years ago Right. I'm like, I, I wouldn't want to go back to that now. You know, right. that's, that's the kind of difference sometimes that can make. Um, and then also, um, I, I should say the difference between counseling and coaching. They're both Absolutely. valuable. Um, but mm-hmm. your counseling is something like for me, it was a marriage counselor. Uh, and so mm-hmm. our marriage counselor, you know, had us write down uh, where we want to be in five years as a couple. And so we sat down and, and, and wrote out a bunch of things and I was, you know, kind of cringing when I, when I found that I was like, Ooh, yeah, that was, you know, uh, it was like, it all, it all said, where do we want to be in 2019? And here it is 2020. And I'm just reviewing this. I was like, Ooh, gosh, how did we do? And I'm trying to put myself back into the 2019 mindset. And, and yep. it was amazing how many things that I was able to say. Yeah. This, yeah. We did that. We did that. Yep. We did that. And, you know, that felt really good. To be able to say in, in both of those instances that in a lot of things we're further along than we than we wanted to be. And on right. some things, maybe not so much, but you know, sometimes yep. I like Cheetos and beer. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, it's pizza and beer, yes, yes, for sure. Yeah, but I don't like Cheetos you know, at all. I'm just, I'm just making that up. <laughs> yeah. But you get the nice. point. It's like sometimes we have other goals that, that we don't do quite as well. But with health, right. yeah, hey, guess what? I work with a health coach because I know I have these these issues. And yep. so working with a coach in that regards helps me get, get my mind right and get my strategy right. You know, so that's it's one of those things where it's like almost an addiction. But mm-hmm. but it, as far as like the marriage counseling, for example, we looked at that as more of a checkup. Like, you know, let's let's just make right. sure we're doing okay. I mean, it's like, an, it's like getting the oil change in your car. If you don't change your oil ever, I guess what? Mm-hmm. Your car is going to stop running. Uh, and so I, I look at that, a marriage like that. You know, if you right. don't have those check-ins, you know, that's, that's kind of important. So that's, but that's a different, you know, and I, I don't know if marriage coaching really is a thing, but yeah. maybe I can invent that. I'm, I'm sure know. somebody's, I'm sure somebody's doing it, but yeah, big difference in between therapy, which is typically very, very rearward looking, you know, like what in your past led you to this moment and coaching very forward looking. I like those delineations as well. Um, you know, it's, it's really an interesting thing to, have somebody who like believes in you more than you might believe in yourself. That's weird. (laughs) Yeah. But it's tremendously validating. I would say if you're finding it, if you're, if you're seeking out a coach and you talk to them about it, if, if setting agreements with each other is not number one on their priority list, you might Mm -hmm. consider a different coach because the power is in the agreements. Expectations always lead you to disappointment agreements are so strong. Like I agree. We're going to do this. I agree. We're going to do this. I agree. We're going to do this. We're committed in this together. That's going to be a great coaching experience. Um, but if you don't, if you don't find those things, be a little skeptical. Yep. And I guarantee you like everyone who has ever done a coaching experience with me before is, is smiling and nodding their heads right now. It's like, yep, that was the first thing. <laughs> right, and right. It's important. I, a cheerleader is great, but be, you know, a coach is different than a cheerleader. A coach can be a cheerleader at times. Um, and, but you know, if you need a cheerleader, you can hire one of those too. <laughs> no, it's true. And, and one of the things I come to realize is that, you know, again, talking about the portability of skill sets, um, I've realized a portability to what I'm doing coaching as well. It's like, okay, there are life lessons that I've learned from, uh-huh. you know, 20 years of doing it and consulting work and all that kind of stuff. And I can, I guess more than 20 years now, but whatever it's, you distill these things down and you learn a lot more than that. So you can coach outside of that. And a lot of times right. people think of like, you know, coaching like teachers, you know, like, um, you know, well, and then I I'm guilty of this um, because I branded myself as the Citrix coach. Um, sure. And, you know, so teach me I, everything I did, you know about Citrix. Yeah. Actually, we're going to talk about communication and skill set and how to write. Yeah. <laughs> Bait and switch. Yes, exactly. And so it is. Right. 
it has been a challenge. I'm not going to lie. Uh, it's been yep. one of those weird things where it's just like, well, gosh, now what do I do? Do I change my Twitter handle? And can I do that even? You know, yeah. <laughs> right. Done rabbit holes. But yeah, so it, it, it is important to, to find the right, the right thing for the right fit. So if it's training you need, find training. If it's counseling you need, if you're, if you're just like have life issues, mm-hmm. get counseling, uh, get, get oh, therapy. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. Uh, but if it's something where you just want to move forward and get unstuck, you know, that's, that's a good fit for coaching for sure. Right. Right. Yeah. Coaching is so, not a treatment for depression. It's like, you know, right. <laughs> you need actual clinically trained therapists for that type of thing. And, and sometimes medication and other things. And that's a whole, whole, that whole nother thing. But yeah, if you want yeah. to move forward, move, get unstuck, coaching can be great. I did want to talk about the, um, um, Elevaros course as well. Sure. I think that's sure. really important for people to know about. Uh, uh-huh. so, um, I uh, can give the overview, but uh, basically there's a, uh, not just an honesty to, to what you put together, but there's a um, uh, kind of those practical soft skills that, sure. that um, well, I'm going to, I'm going to butcher it. Why don't you just explain? <laughs> no, I, I love the way, because you, you see it differently than I do. And everybody right. that's gone through it, has, it sees it differently than me. And I get different feedback which is great. And, and, you know, suggestions for improvement are, are also, are so fun too, but it's absolutely that Venn diagram we talked about, you know, of the self-management, the empathy or understanding others piece and like really practical, like story-based, you know, like this scenario happens, mm-hmm. you know, how would you, how would you approach that? How would you go through that? Um, very experiential, very, <laughs> none of it is made up. It's the things I've actually lived and, and seen other people live through. So like, these are the, these are the things, you know, there's 10 segments in self-management and there's 10 segments in empathy or uh, understanding others. Um, I want to say funny, a funny thing about empathy. I was leading a workshop with about 12 technologists and I came up, you know, newly showing this kind of framework to people. And I said the word empathy, and like, we're going to cover half of the time in empathy. And you would think that I had sprinkled holy water on a demon. There's just people that sort of recoiled in fear and terror. <laughs> Awesome. And I was like, okay, we're going to soften that up. We're going to talk about understanding other people, you know, like but it's really fundamentally where it's at. Cause if I, if I said to you, you need to be more empathetic, you need to be a better empath. Like, well, okay. But Hey, we're going to understand others. We're going to get better at understanding others today has a different, different feel, but that's the course. Um, it's, it's pretty accessible. It's 10 short lessons. It's a, you know, a short reading, a video and some questions to ask yourself, um, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's, it's super fun. It's super interesting to see how there are different takeaways for just about everybody that has gone through it. And, you know, um, it's a lot of fun. Love it. Yeah. yeah and we will have a link obviously in our, in our show notes where people can go find that course. It's definitely worth checking out for sure. Okay. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, in fact, I, I was thinking too, that it's not just, you know, we should know that it's, it, probably applies to more than just technology uh, people it's uh, <laughs> probably important to say as well i'm smiling at it um because you know there was a a group of accountants who were you know like someone recommended they're like you need to take ken's course you guys have the same challenges that the technology folks do <laughs> And I was like, well, all my stories are about technology. I don't sure, I'm sure the skills are definitely needed in many different industries. Um, yeah, I was thinking and, like just some, being some a project human. managers or some project managers, project, yeah. some others. It, it is, it does have some technology bent to it, but you know, maybe that's my next iteration is to make it more accessible to, to others and, and, and other organizations. But yeah, yeah, that's funny, you know, like. There, you know, I, I was talking to this lady and she was like, yeah, our accountants don't know how to uh, communicate. You know, whenever I ask a dumb question, they treat me like I'm dumb. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, those are similar problems um, that we, <laughs> we try to try to weed out in the technology world. But. Yep. Absolutely fun. true. Love it. Cool. Well, uh, Ken, thanks for being yeah. with us today. I really appreciate your time. I uh, really yeah. appreciate the the honest conversation. I'm hoping that people are going to get a lot out of this. If people want to get in touch with you, how would they do that? Sure. You can email me at Ken 
at elevaros.com, E-L-E-V-A-R-O-S.com. Uh, DJ, I'll have a link there. I'm K Brorin at Twitter. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. You can hit me in all of those places. Awesome. Well, again, thank you so much for being with us today. Really appreciate your time and input and uh, yeah, definitely yeah. wish you well in all that you do. Thanks, DJ. It was a lot of fun. Um, thanks for thanks for the invite and thanks for an honest and engaging conversation yourself. This was fun. All right, everyone. Hopefully you got a lot out of that conversation as I did. And I hope this is going to be very uplifting for you and you can take some things from today and put them into action. Now, we have a very special offer for you on Ken's course. Uh, there's a lot that we didn't discover uh, during the call, but I will tell you that this is a very useful course for practical career development, not just you know skill sets that, that uh, are normally talked about. And so Ken ha has obviously a, uh, a much different approach and a much more uplifting approach to a lot of these things that's more practical. And so I highly encourage you to check out his course so much so that we've arranged for a discount on said course. And so if you go to thrive-it.com slash elevate, that's thrive-it.com slash elevate, that will take you to the uh, offer for Ken's course. And so please do that. Uh, we'll have a coupon code in the description below. You'll need that as well. And that will get you 20% off until August 1st of 2021. If you're listening to this after the fact, don't worry. We've still got you covered with a, a special offer for people who enroll f with that uh, link. So check that out. And as always, make sure you get subscribed. If you're watching this on YouTube, go ahead and click the like button. If you are uh, on the podcast, hey, give us a, a favorable review. We'd, we'd appreciate that. And as always, thank you for watching. I hope you will share this with others that might be needing it. We can't get the word out by ourselves. We need your help. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. Thor wanted to say hi. Thor would like some attention, so he yeah. gets attention. Hi, Thor. Bye, That's Thor. Cute. That's a cute cat.